Hello and welcome back. So this is lecture two, and this lecture provides a jump start for you to get to know the basic steps of analyzing algorithms. And in this lecture, we deal with uh, sorting problems, and we will go through two sorting algorithms. First, the insertion sort, and second, then the merge sort. So for the insertion sort, we will introduce uh, how to use pseudocode to describe an algorithm. And then we will learn the way to check the correctness of the algorithm by analyzing the pseudocode. And then more importantly, we will learn how to um, analyze the running time. And when analyzing the running time of those insertion of the sorting problem, we, we are basically concerned with how the running time uh, increases with the uh, increases with the size of the inputs. And we'll do the same thing, basically the same thing for the merge sort when we analyze it. So we'll deal with pseudocode and the, the running time analysis. <clears throat> so as you can see, there are two parts, uh, the insertion sort and the merge sort. So I want to uh, split the whole lecture into two parts. And on Tuesday, we'll deal with insertion sort. And in uh, on Thursday, we'll talk about more about merge sorts, and finally, we'll make a uh, final comparison of the two algorithms. Okay, so now let's get started. Okay, so before we talk about insertion sort, let's first have an, an uh, brief overview of what a sorting problem is. So for a sorting problem, we are taking an input uh, of a sequence of n numbers from a1 to an, and we want a output as a permutation of the original sequence so that in the output sequence, a1 prime is less than or equal to a2 and less than a3 until an. Okay, so, so this is the problem. This is how the sorting problem is defined. And for insertion sort, before we look at the formal description of the of the algorithm. Actually, it works the way that we sort a hand of playing cards. Okay, so what we usually do when we sort when we are playing cards, we want to sort a card uh, a pile of cards. Is that we first have a pile of cards facing down on the table, and we start with an empty hand. Okay. And then we take one card at a time from the table and insert that card into the correct position in our hand. Okay. And we want to find the correct position for a card. In order to do that, we need to compare the one compare the card that we take from the table to each of the cards that are already in our hand. Okay. So if, uh, if you have experience playing cards, then you must understand what I'm talking about. Let's have a short demo of the playing cards analogy. Okay, to insert and sort. So here I have a pile of cards in the same color, just for simplicity. Okay, so I shuffled them to make sure that they are in unsorted order. And then I place them on here and place it on a table. So this is our table here. And I so first I start with a with an empty can with an empty hand. So I don't have any sorted card. So I first take one card from the table. Okay. So it's three. And here I have one card in my hand. And you can think of it as a sorted order because it's just one element. So it's sorted anyway. And then I'll take one card, take the second card from the table. Okay, so it's Q. So because, and then I compare this Q uh, queen card with three, because it's larger than three, and I place it to the right of three. Okay. And then I take the third card. Okay, so it's Jack. So in order to find the correct position to insert into those already sorted uh, cards, I need to compare J with uh, all the cards in my hand, in my right hand. I first compare with um, 3, it's larger than 3. 
and then I compare it with queen. It's smaller than queen, so I need to insert it in the middle of three and queen. Okay, and for the next one, it's eight. It's larger than three and smaller than jack, so I insert it between three and uh, jack. The next one is six. I compare with three and then eight, and I stop. Okay, so I have five cards in sorted order. So hopefully this small game shows uh, the basic idea of insurgent sort. Now let's look at the pseudocode implementation for insertion sort. So here's the code. And don't worry too much about it if you don't understand some of the notations. Um, because this is the first time that we uh, use pseudocode in this course. And there will be a more detailed uh, tutorial of what those naming uh, conventions in writing pseudocode is about. Okay, so uh, let's look at each line first. So there are eight lines uh, of pseudocode implementing a function, or in this course we will call it a uh, procedure named insurgent sort. And uh, it's a bit like uh, the function that you uh, write in other programming languages like Java or Python or C. Okay, so it's a function like, but we call it procedure in this course. So it takes an input, takes an, an array A as its input, and for in the line, first line, there is a for loop um, that goes through J equals 2 to A to the length of A. And the second line, it copies the uh, values of the J's elements of A to the variable key and the third line is a comment so it's not executed it's just an explanation of the function and the fourth line it's uh, it copies j minus one to the variable i and from line five to seven it's a while loop that is embedded in the uh, in the for loop so it's an inner 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 loop uh, within uh, the outer loop outer for loop so uh, this while loop uh, uh, decrease i by one after each step. And within each step, within each iteration, it copies the, the value of a, uh, i to a i plus one, okay? And after the while loop is executed, there is another statement which copies the value in key to the i plus one elements of a. Okay, so that's uh, what those eight lines of pseudocode is about. So as you can see, the procedure needs to take an input of array uh, that contains the uh, sequence of n numbers to be sorted, right? But as you may notice already, this procedure doesn't return anything. It's not like a function that returns something. So it sorts the input numbers in place. That means it rearranges numbers within the array A itself, but it doesn't reallocate other uh, memory space to store the sorted results. So uh, this may be something that you want to uh, pay attention to. In previous slide, I just described what each line of pseudocode does in plain language. And I think it will be more, much easier to understand uh, what, these line, what these lines of codes really do using a, uh, a small real example. So let's consider the input sequence 5, 2, 4, 6, 1, 3. Okay. And we know that the length of it is 6. So let's break down the uh, each steps of running this insertion sort procedure on this input, on this particular input. Okay, so because uh, we have a for loop in line 1, and 
the for loop start from j equals 2 to a dot length. So 2, the j equals 2 indicates the second element of the input uh, sequence. So these cells uh, in this figure shows the original input in A, which is 5, 2, 4, 6, 1, 3. Okay. And uh, uh, the cell with black background indicates uh, the current position of J. Okay. So currently, the initial, in the initial state, J equals 2. And the cell on its left in light with light gray background is the elements that we're gonna go through in the while loop. Okay, so we're gonna uh, see uh, how we uh, how we how each step in the in a while loop goes. So uh, when i equals two, uh, we first copy the value of the second element, which is also two to the variable key. So we let key, variable key to remember the second element of the input A, okay? And then we let uh, I equals, we define I, we copy I minus one to, uh, we copy J minus one to I. So because J is two, then I is now one. And I equals one satisfy the conditions of this while loop because one is larger than zero and uh, a1 is larger than key because a1 is 5 and 5 is larger than 2 which is the key so we need to execute, execute the uh, statements uh, within the while loop so what the first statement what the line 6 does is to exchange is to uh, not exchange but to copy uh, a1 to a2 Right, because i equals 1 now. Therefore, now we have uh, the, the uh, cell here, the second cell, the black cell becomes uh, 5. right? And then we'll decrease i by 1. Then i becomes 0. Okay. Then after we have a new value for i, the while loop will still check whether the new i satisfy the while condition. And because i equals zero, then it breaks the first condition. Therefore, uh, it'll exit, exit, ex uh, exit the while loop. That means the while loop terminates. Okay, and then we go to the last line, line eight. Then because i equals to zero now, and then a, the, the i plus one's element is a one. Then we copy the key, which is two, to the first element uh, of a. Okay, so we use two arrows to indicate uh, the line six code and line eight. So the gray arrow indicates the step that we copy uh, uh, a i to a i plus one, where i equals 1 okay and we use an arrow in black to indicate the last copy statement which copies the key into the um, i plus one's uh, element okay so that is the first step of the outer loop outer for loop okay then we go through, then after the first step, the elements, the elements in uh, A becomes like this. It becomes two, five, four, six, one, three. Okay, you notice that the first two elements exchange their values. And then it's our second step. And J is three now, and the key becomes the third element, which is four. And then we let I start from two, because three minus one is two. So 
we do the same thing. We do the same thing in uh, from line five to line seven. So because uh, five is greater than the key, five is greater than the key four, then we need to copy uh, the value in uh, A2 to A3, right? And then because when I equals one, the second condition AI is larger than key, no longer satisfied because the key is four now. But when I equals one, the value of A1 is two. Two is not larger than four. Therefore, the uh, while loop will terminate after uh, the line six code, the line six statement is executed, is executed just once, okay? So then we go to line eight, in which case we just copy the key back to the second element here. So after the second step, the uh, input the, the input sequence becomes two, four, five, and six, one, three. As you can see, the first three elements are already sorted. Okay, and then we do the same thing for j equals uh, four. When j equals four, it's a bit special because here. Um, I equals j minus one uh, equals three, so uh, I three is five, and the key is six. So the initial condition, the condition of the while loop, does not satisfy. So uh, none of the line six or seven uh, code will be executed in this case. Therefore, we just jump to line eight, uh, where we copy the key back to uh, the fourth element itself, okay? And you can do the uh, rest of the uh, iterations yourself. So for j equals five, you can count how many uh, uh, inner loops iterations are done. And for the last elements, j equals to six, basically the same thing will be done. And eventually, we will reach a point where all elements in A are already uh, iterated and the resulting uh, uh, array A itself is a sorted array. That means all the elements in the A is in a sorted order from one to six. So hopefully this breakdown of the uh, insert and sort procedure shows uh, how the uh, algorithm works. If we look at the pseudocode carefully, then we can realize that some of the variables correspond to the concepts in our previously mentioned playing card examples. For example, here, uh, the variable j actually indicates the current card being inserted. And if you look at the property, the, the variable j minus one, then actually the elements from a1 to a j minus one consist of the currently sorted cards. And what's rest in the array from uh, a from j plus one to a n corresponds to the remaining pile of cards on the table. Okay. And in fact, the elements from a one to a j minus one, they are the elements originally in position one through j minus one. The only difference is that they are now in sorted order after the J iteration of the for loop. So this sentence actually describes a property that are formally called loop invariants. And when we analyze algorithms, we'll use 
such a property, such loop invariant to check the correctness of an algorithm. When we use a loop invariant to check the correctness of an algorithm, we need to show three things about this property. First, the first condition is called initialization. That means we need to check if this loop invariant is true prior to the first iteration of the loop. And second condition is called maintenance. That means if we need to check if it is true before an iteration, and then it must remain true before the next iteration. The third condition is called termination. So when a loop terminates, the invariant gives a useful property that shows the algorithm is correct. So this loop invariant is particularly useful when there are uh, loops or multiple one loop or multiple lo uh, loops involved in an algorithm. So in our particular case here, in the insertion sort, uh, we define our loop invariant as the elements from A1 to J minus 1 are the elements originally in position 1 through position J minus 1 in sorted order. So let's check if this loop invariant is uh, true uh, in these three conditions. So first, initialization. Let's look at the case before uh, the first loop, loop iteration. So when j, because j starts from 2, then let's look at j equals 2. Then the subarray a1 to j minus 1 actually consists, just, consists of just one single element, a1. Therefore, it is sorted. Therefore, the loop invariant holds. Then let's look at the maintenance condition. So uh, let's assume that before an iteration, before the jth iteration, then let's say the elements, assume that the elements in a1 to j, aj minus 1 is already sorted. Then what the pseudo, what the algorithm does in the jth loop is that it moves elements aj minus 1 to aj minus 2, aj minus 3, and so on by one position to the right. right? That's what it does uh, from line um, 4 to line, uh, line 4 to line 7 using this inner wire loop until it finds a proper position for aj to insert the current key, which is aj, right? And then at this proper position, it will insert the value of aj, which is done by line 8. So now the subarray a1 to j consists of the elements originally in a1 to j, but in sorted order. Okay, and remember that after the for loop, the for loop will increment j automatically for us. So uh, before the next iteration starts, the loop invariance is preserved, right? Uh, so because the next uh, for loop starts with j plus one, right, and to to the variable, to the value j plus 1, the subarray a1 to j is already sorted, is the uh, original, originally, is the elements originally in the a1 to j, but in sorted order. Okay. And then let's look at the, um, okay, so before we move on, uh, we need to we need to mention that I need to mention that there's a more formal examination required to show that the inner loop the while loop also works correctly because it, there's another loop 
uh, uh, involved here. But just for simplicity in our analysis, um, we don't uh, we don't do this. We just assume that the while loop works correctly. We just want to show that the outer for loop uh, works correctly. And of course, for the inner loop, if we want to show it show its correctness formally, we need to use a new loop invariant. The third step is to check the loop invariance uh, for the termination condition. So when the condition causing the for loop to terminate is j is greater than the length of a, which we write as n. Okay. So we must have j equals n plus 1 when the loop terminates. Then we, when we substitute n plus 1 for j into our loop invariant, which is uh, from a1 to aj minus 1, then we have the subarray a1 to n consists of the elements originally in a1 to n, but in sorted order. So this is the result that we want. This subarray is the entire area A itself. Therefore, the algorithm, the algorithm is correct. So in this way, we checked uh, three conditions, initialization, maintenance, and termination conditions for the loop invariant to, to show that the loop invariant holds uh, in all those, on all these three conditions. Um, uh, therefore, this is the a formal way to check the correctness of a uh, algorithm, especially when there is um, four loops, uh, there are loops involved in the algorithm. So far, we already have some taste of the pseudocode and use pseudocode to implement in search and sort. So now let's formally give some, uh, define some conventions um, to the pseudocode that will be used uh, <clears throat> in this course. So, uh, so this is the insertion sort algorithm defined in uh, by pseudocode, and we use indention to indicate block structure uh, instead of the curly uh, brackets, or the we all avoid and we all avoid using the begin and end keywords. Um, in some that are used in some programming languages. Okay, we just use indention, so it's a very uh, Python-like style. So, and for looping structures, we use for, while, repeat, and to such keywords to define the looping construct. Construct, and an important property of a looping construct is that the loop counter remains its value after the loop. Um, terminates. So immediately after the loop, the counter's value is the value that first exceeds the loop bound. So in the case of the outer for loop for, uh, for j equals 2 to a dot length, then after the for loop ends, the value of j is a length plus 1, because that's the value that immediately, that first exceeds the loop bound of a dot length. Okay, and uh, we access every elements by the square brackets, by a number, by an integer number in the brackets, right? And we need to pay attention to the uh, fact that our index starts from one, not from zero, like most programming language, uh, most programming languages do. Okay. And we can access the attrib uh, attribute of an object using a dot syntax like most uh, object-oriented object languages uh, do. Like we uh, can access the length of the array by a dot length. Another uh, important convention about um, uh, the pseudocode is the usage of arguments. So here, the arguments to our procedure uh, in certain sorts is the array, right? So the array A is passed by value. That means the caller procedure will receive its own copy. 
right? So if the callee assigns a new value to the arguments, then the change is not seen by the caller. And because here A is an object, A is an array object, when the objects are passed, the pointer to the object is copied, but the object's attributes are not. So what we pass is, our, is just the, the, the pointer to that object. So if for in this example, if X is an argument of a callee procedure, then if we assign it to a new uh, value, to a new variable in the callee procedure, then this assignment is not visible to the caller. But if, if we assign, uh, if, if we assign its um, member of that project to a new value, then this change is visible. So uh, in the second example, when arrays are passed by pointer, the change of individual array elements, they are indeed visible to the caller procedure. So this mechanism makes sure that we can implement in sort and sort in a in-place style. So when we assign values to the elements in A by such syntax by A I plus one equals something or A plus uh, a i plus 1 equals the key in line 6 and line 8 such assignments will change the uh, will such change will be seen by the caller procedure so this change will be in place so far so that's all about the con conventions of the pseudocode used in this course of course uh, let me switch the camera okay so the conventions for pseudocode are quite uh, flexible, so you can define your own pseudocode or you can make minor change so that the, the grammar may look uh, more uh, comfortable to you. But uh, in order to be consistent in this whole course, we uh, predefine the conventions uh, here. And uh, uh, no worry too much about the uh, argument parsing rules here because there are uh, concepts like objects and uh, pointers uh, that we have talked about, but uh, as as long as you see uh, much pseudocode uh, as we will do for the future algorithms, as long as you see more and more of them, then you will uh, see, you will understand uh, the, the rules behind the argument parsing in, uh, in our pseudocode. When we analyze algorithms Besides its correctness, we also care about the efficiency. So when we talk about um, the efficiency of algorithms, we actually care about a lot of aspects. For example, how many, how much memories it costs, and uh, how much communication bandwidth, and what specific hardware does it require, and so on. But more importantly, most importantly, among all those factors, computational time is the most important one. So in order to um, estimate the running time of an algorithm, we need to first have a simplified model of computers because, you know, different computers run in different speed and a same algorithm runs differently, even given uh, the same inputs on different computers. So. Uh, we need to have a simplified model. So in this model, we assume that there is just one processor or one CPU and it's random access memory, use RAM model. So uh, more specifically, under the assumption of this uh, simplified model of computer, we assume that instructions are executed one after another. So there's no concurrent operations. There's no parallel. Uh, parallel computing. And um, we also assume that using this simplified model, we should allow uh, several uh, numbers of primitive instructions. Um, for example, most of those arithmetic instructions like adding two numbers, subtracting one number from another, multiply, divide, and so on. 
and like very uh, primitive data movements uh, instructions like load um, some number or store some number like or copy some number and uh, other um, uh, control instructions like conditional branch if else uh, calling a uh, sub procedure uh, sub function and so on and we all assume that these primitive instructions they take a constant time constant amount of time and we don't um, bother to differentiate the um, the amount of times between those among those primitive instructions we just uh, view them as as the uh, we just uh, consider that they should uh, cost the same amount of money uh, of, of time when we analyze the running time of insertion sort uh, we need to keep in mind that the time taken by insertion sort procedure uh, that we defined before depends actually depends on the size of inputs it takes longer to sort longer inputs uh, arrays uh, and I think that's obvious and it takes shorter for input arrays that are already nearly sorted so that means even for input arrays of almost the same size if one of them is almost sorted then uh, it takes shorter for the uh, for for sorting that almost sorted uh, input. So in general, uh, uh, we can assume that the time taken uh, for running the insertion sort on the on the, on the on the input sequence should grow with the size of inputs. And uh, traditionally, it is a we usually use the. Uh, describe the running time of an algorithm as a function of the input size okay and we use that that function to uh, characterize the efficiency uh, uh, of a, of an of an algorithm so uh, but before that we need to define uh, running time and input size carefully so usually for input size we use the number of items in uh, in our inputs or total number of bits and for running time um, we usually use the number of primitive instructions or steps uh, that are executed so the primitive instructions include the ones that we introduced in the previous slides for example adding two numbers uh, multiply two numbers loading something or copying something okay and we also need to keep in mind that we want those primitive instructions to be defined as machine independent as possible. We don't want those uh, instructions or steps depend on some uh, very fast machine. But it turns out that uh, the, our, estimates, our estimation for the running time is not accurate when the algorithm is run on a different machine. So that's uh, what we want to avoid. So we actually really need to uh, define those notations, define those uh, primitive uh, instructions uh, very carefully. Okay. So um, a common uh, assumption that we hold when we uh, define running time is that uh, we, we assume that a constant amount of time is required to execute each line of pseudocode. And we can assume that each execution of the i-th line takes time ci, which is a constant. Okay, so here the unit of ci is uh, number of primitive instructions. So it's not the time in uh, in second, but the time in a number of primitive instructions. And uh, each line is executed for a certain number of times here this time is the count actually that uh, which is a integer numbers okay so in this uh, example uh, in the pseudocode of insertion sorts then we can assume that the first line the for loop the the line one for 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 check the for loop uh, 
each each time we check whether j satisfies the loop condition, then it costs c i uh, that many c one many a uh, number of uh, primitive instructions. So we say that the line one costs c i time. So next we need to answer the question of how many times that each line of code is executed exactly. Um, so let's look at the first line, which is a for loop test uh, statement. So because j iterates from 2 to a dot length, so if we assume that the length of a is the number n, the integer n, then uh, j iterates from 2 to n. So from 2 to n is n minus n minus 1 uh, uh, integers. So, but we need to keep in mind that uh, after the last iteration of the for loop, the for loop uh, test statement, the for test for loop test statement will still check if the new j, which is uh, n, n plus one now, the, the, the test statement will check if that new j is within that uh, loop arrange, uh, uh, range. So that will bring in one more, uh, one additional uh, time of execution. Therefore, for the first uh, line of code, the actual running time, the actual number of times is n, not n uh, uh, minus one. But for the uh, uh, lines of code within the for loop body, that is line two, three, four, and uh, number line line eight. They the running the the number of times that they are executed are n minus one because um, uh, because f f uh, a j iterates from two to n so they execute they are executed that many uh, number of times. Okay, so I left the um, um, number of times for line five to seven empty because. This is a tricky question. We don't know. We don't know yet how many number of times the inner while loop are executed, right? Because it's a while loop, and we don't know when this uh, while loop condition is satisfied or not. We don't know when this while loop, uh, a while loop is will will stop, will terminate within each uh, uh, for loop iteration, right? So we have to make some um, make some guess of how many times those while loop statements are executed. So uh, what we can do is that we assume that for each uh, j, because j ranges from two to n, then we 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 assume that uh, with for each j, the while loop test is executed t j many times. We give it a a, a simple t j. And uh, we admit that we don't know this number yet. Okay, so because j ranges from two to n, then uh, among all the number of iterations, the total number of times that these while loops are executed is the summation of t j from j equals two to n. Okay, so let's rewrite the whole thing uh, now. So this column is the cost, uh, constant cost for each uh, uh, line of code. And the second column is the number of times for that each, uh, uh, each line is ex executed. So notice that here for line five, the number of time is the summation of tj from j equals two to n, because we, we make some guess about the uh, number of times for each j okay and here for line six and line seven it's the summation of tj minus one that's for the same reason for the for loop you see that the test uh, statement for the for loop runs for n times but the body of the for loop runs n plus n minus one times and the same thing applies to the while loop because the test statements always need one additional uh, execution to decide if 
uh, if the uh, the while loop needs to terminate. Okay, so the body of the while loop runs uh, the summation of tj minus one that many times. Okay, so far we have or cost constant cost and the number of times um, available uh, for the insertion short. So as you can see that the number of times they are uh, functions of the input size. So the n is the, uh, the, the size of the array A. And then there's a simple uh, uh, rule or simple computational computation rule to decide the total number the total uh, uh, running time of the insertion sorts uh, uh, on the on the input size of n elements. Okay, so the rule is that the total running time Tn of an input of n values is a summation of the running times for each statement executed. So because line one is uh, executed n times, and each time it costs C1 many. And for line two, it's executed n minus one times, and each time it costs c two. So it's straightforward to have the uh, conclusion that the each statement that costs c i to execute and executes n times will contribute c i times n to the total, right? And then the total is therefore the summation of all the products for each lines. It's C1 times N plus C2 times N minus 1 plus C4 times N minus 1 and C5 times the summation here and C6 times the summation here and so on. So we just sum up all those products to have the total number of running time on an input of N uh, uh, elements. So now we have this uh, function t of n uh, to describe the efficiency, uh, to describe the running time of uh, insertion algorithm on the input of n elements. So uh, we can use this function to describe the efficiency, but uh, we have to see that there is still uncertainty here. Right? We have we have t j, which is unknown at this point. So that means even for for inputs of equals for of of the same n the running time could be different because different sequences may have different tj's right so uh, we need to that's why we need to consider the worst case the the possible the worst possible case and the best possible case for uh for the running time of insertion sort so the burst case occurs obviously when the input array is already sorted. That means the 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 first element is the smallest and it's always smaller than the next element. So if the input is like this, then when the algorithm in certain algorithm runs, when it reaches the step five, line line five, whenever we make the comparison of whether AI is larger than key or not, because AI is already uh, smaller than the key, right? Because A is initially, because I is initially J minus one. That means AI is the element before AJ, right? So this, uh, this condition is never satisfied. So it always breaks the while loop test at line five. So that means for, for this, perfect um, best case, the tj is always one. The body of the while loop is never executed, right? So if tj is always one, then if we replace tj equals one in our previous function here, then this, the, sorry, so, if we replace um, uh, tj equals one, then the this c, uh, c6 item and c7 item, they disappear, okay? And then we can write the function tn as 
this function. And if we simplify it, it becomes c1 plus c2 plus c4 plus c5 plus ca times n minus the rest of the constants. Okay, So we can further simplify this form as a n plus b for constants a and b that are dependent on the con uh, statement const costs ci's right because they are a bunch of constants and we can just simplify it by writing it as another as a new constant a and b so it means that the running time in the best case uh where in which the input error is already sorted then the running time of insertion is a linear function of n Next, let's look at the worst case of running time for insertion sort. So the worst case happens when the input is reverse sorted order, in reverse order. So in this case, our, if you remember the, uh, the, the pseudocode implementations, because each element is always larger than the next one so ai is always larger than ai plus one so that means the when the while loop the inner loop inner while loop is executed we need to the the condition is always satisfied and we must compare each element aj with each element in the entire sorted sub array before that is from a a one to a j minus one. So we need to uh, com com compare this key with all the uh, elements before. So the result for this case is that t j is j for uh, j equals j from two to n because the the, the for loop in the for loop j uh, ranges uh, iterates from two to n and then within each iteration the tj is uh, equals to to j so as a result the summation from 2 to n of tj is the summation of uh, j so it's a, it, it becomes an arithmetic series and the results can be uh, computed rather easy right if we remember, just use the equations of the summation of arithmetic series so here on the left it's actually the summation of tj and here is actually the summation of uh, tj minus one because tj is j then we can use the uh, 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 equations okay so let's replace those terms into our original tn function then um, the item for c5 becomes like this and for c6 and c7 they are no longer zeros Right. So there's a bunch of summations. So if we simplify this function, it becomes a bunch of constant times n squared plus a bunch of constant times n minus some constant. So like we, what we did for the uh, best case, now we can express this worst case running time as a times n squared plus b n plus c for some constants a and b and c that are dependent on the uh, statement cost, cost ci. Okay, as you can see, this is a in the worst case, t n is a quadratic function of n. And if you remember the best case, t n is a linear function of of n. So, given the uh, running time function of the best case inputs, uh, which is a linear function, and the running time of the worst case running uh, inputs, which is a quadratic function, we need to choose one to um, characterize the efficiency of insertion sort. Right? Um, and the common practice is that we usually use the worst case running time. And for reason that the worst case running time gives an upper bound for any input. So it is a guarantee that the algorithm will never take any longer because we are already analyzing the worst case. It couldn't be, it couldn't be any worse, any, any further worse, right? So, and for some algorithms, the worst case occurs 
fairly often, right? For example, when you search a database, when the information is absent, then you have to go over all, all entries in the database. So that is uh, the, the worst case scenario. And if we concern a so-called average case, then we can often find that the average case can be as bad as the worst case. So take the insertion sorting problem, exa for example. Suppose we randomly choose n numbers for n in for insertion sort. And then we need to define, we need to determine tj, right? tj is unknown. We need to determine um, how long does it take for the uh, inner while loop to determine where to insert aj among the already sorted sequence a1 to aj minus 1, right? So as uh, a thought for average case, we can think of the problem, we can think of the case that on average, half of the elements in the already sorted sequence are less than aj, and the other half are greater, right? Because we, we randomly choose numbers. And therefore, we need to make, um, j divided by two times um, comparisons. So that's the new number of tj. And the resulting average case running time is a summation of uh, j over 2 f for j from 2 to j equals n, right? So the summation of that series is still a in a quadratic function of n. So it's no better just no better than the worst case running time. So the, the order of the function is still a quadratic function. So uh, that's why we say I mean, oftentimes the average case is as bad as the worst case. And it even uh, strengthens the necessity for using worst case to uh, analyze the efficiency of an algorithm. So next, I want to talk about the concept of order of growth. So when we are analyzing, when we just analyze the, the running time for the both worst case and best case uh, inputs for insertion sort algorithm, we used a lot of simplifications. We used a lot of abstractions of the expressions. So for example, we, we ignore the actual cost. We just use constant ci instead. And we use further abstraction like in the form of uh, Tn uh, as a form of, of uh, quadratic function, a generic quadratic for function. And we use constant a and b and c instead of those a bunch of ci's, right? So, so we can make a further simplifying abstraction. So because we don't, given the uh, worst case running time as a quadratic function, a n squared plus b n plus c, we can make a further simplification because it is the order of growth, it's the rate of growth that really interests us. So therefore, we can just consider the leading term, which is a times n squared. Because the lower order terms, b n and c, they become relatively insignificant if we have a <coughs> n that is large enough, right? And we can also ignore the leading terms coefficient a. We can just, because the, the constant factors are, they are less significant when n are, are very large, very big. So we can write this worst case running time as this form. T of n equals theta of n squares, meaning that the function T of n grows as fast as the function n squared, okay? But we will have a more formal introduction to this um, theta notation. And we will have other two notations to describe the order of growth for a running time function. Okay, so here it is just a, a, a very brief introduction. And for large enough n, a theta of n squared algorithm runs more quickly than the theta of n uh, cube algorithms, right? And we'll see that we'll see in the uh, in the lecture of of Thursday on Thursday we'll see a 
a, a faster pro, uh, faster algorithm than insurgent sort than a worst case input when a when a worst case insurgent sort algorithms. So uh, here the theta annotations you can just uh, take a look and uh, remember that we can use this notation to describe how 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 quickly a algorithm runs. So that's it for today's lecture. And we covered the insertion sorts. We use pseudocode to describe the, the, the sorting insertion sorts algorithm. And we analyze its correctness and its efficiency. Uh, and uh, we'll cover the divide and conquer approach, which is merge sorts algorithm uh, in the lecture on Thursday.